Hi, I'm Andrew Ward, pastor at Community Baptist Church, and we're excited to have you join us for this service. Hey, if you're in the Flagler County area and you don't have a church home, we wanna invite you to come join us. On Sunday mornings, we meet at 1030 for our worship service, and then we have a midweek fill-up service on Wednesdays at 645. I pray that today's message is a blessing. God bless. I wanna turn your attention this evening to 1 Peter chapter 2 is where we're going to be at. 1 Peter chapter 2, continuing on our study through the book of 1 Peter. I read a story about a guy who had moved into a new house only to discover that the house was infested with mice. How would you like to buy a new house and find that it was infested with mice? Well, that's what he found. He decided he was going to get some glue traps, put them out, and the way the glue traps work, there's a, a scent on those traps that attracts the mice to the trap. They step on the track, a trap, and uh, the glue holds them, and they, they can't get loose, and they can then be disposed of. However, because everything doesn't always work as it's supposed to, um, the guy was talking about how he had found a mouse who uh, was trapped on there, and uh, he couldn't get loose, and he proceeded, the mouse, to gnaw his leg off, <laughs> to, to get loose from that, that trap. I know it's a disgusting illustration, isn't it? Oh my. <clears throat> but, but it's a great picture of what we're going to be talking about here tonight. It's a powerful in illustration of how uh, our desire can sometimes be so overwhelming that we're willing to engage in that desire even to our detriment. That something can become so important to us that we're willing to sacrifice virtually everything else to be able to, to get that, that desire. And so with that, we're going to take a look at that tonight here in 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at verse uh, 11 and 12. So if you'll join with me, let's look at God's Word. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come once again to you this evening, giving you praise for who you are, worthy of worship and honor and praise, we also again give you thanks. You have seen fit to make yourself known to us. You have given us your inspired and inerrant word. Father, may it never grow common to us the significance of the fact that in our hands we hold the very word of God, that you have told us who you are, that you have told us who we are. You've told us how we can be saved. And you told us about the future hope that we have in the soon return of Jesus Christ. May these things always grip our hearts with great joy and gladness. May we live our lives by faith, trusting in you. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would minister in this time. Lord, as we look into your word, we ask God that you would illuminate the truth to us. We ask that you would open our hearts and our will that we would respond to you by faith, following you. It's committed to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so we're going to continue on our study here in uh, 1 Peter. You remember I, I shared with you, um, we're talking about a letter that was written or directed to, now Peter uses the, the, the two words here, um, aliens and scattered, back in chapter 1, verse 1, talking about uh, the people here, and, and, and he's helping us to understand um, how is it that we're to respond in troubling, difficult circumstances, trials. People are, are considered aliens. People are scattered, very likely scattered by uh, the Roman government, forced to move from their home, to move to a different location. People very likely suffering persecution, people being rejected by their community. It's a very difficult, challenging time, but there are times that in some measure each one of us can relate to. We've gone through difficult things, haven't we? We face trials and, and struggles in life, and Peter's helping us to uh, understand how do we do that? 
How do we live as followers of Jesus Christ in the midst of that? The main point that I want to bring out to you here in verses 11 and 12 is this. Restrain your desires in order to glorify God and to be a testimony to other people. The main point of what we're looking at here this evening. This verse opens up, uh, verse 11, opens up the practical portion of of Peter's um, teaching and it's going to go on to chapter uh, 4, verse 11. And in this, he's urging believers, followers of Jesus Christ, to live out their faith. Even in the midst of the trouble and the the difficulty that they're facing, Peter says, keep going. Keep living out your, your faith. It's very tempting to go along with the, with the desires of the flesh, uh, to do what just feels right, to do what just feels natural, to just follow along with the cultural norms, especially when you're facing persecution, mocking, ridicule, when your faith is costing you something. It's all the more easy to just go along with it, what everybody else is, is doing. But Peter is trying to help us see what all of Scripture teaches us. That... Christians, followers of Christ, people who have repented of their sin and trusted Christ are new creatures in Christ. We've been given a new, new nature, and we're to be different. Our lives are to be different from, from the lives of, of people who are not followers of Christ. And so Peter's telling us, listen, your life as a follower of Christ is to mean something in very practical ways. And this is a, a very practical topic Peter's going to be talk, talking about here this evening. You see there in verse 11, he opens up, he uses that word beloved. Again, connecting with these people, Peter is a, is a pastor ministering to folks that are, that are struggling and, and, and using that term of endearment coming alongside them. He says, beloved, I urge you. That's, that should capture our attention. Those, those words that he uses to preface what he's about to say. There's an intensity in the statement that Peter is about to make. Don't miss that. It's, this is not just casual reading. Uh, just go along here and read through it, and, and okay, I've done my reading for the day, and I move on. Peter is trying to grab their intention with, with the intensity of this statement. He's telling us, don't think of this as being a suggestion that he's about to give. Rather, he's telling us something essential. This is what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he urges us, and continuing on, Addressing them, he says, as aliens or and strangers. You could also translate that statement, since you are aliens and strangers. Uh, the idea with these two words, building one on top of another, the, the word alien there, uh, that's a person who's living in a, in a foreign country. They're living somewhere that's, that's not their, their home. And, and the word stranger, again, it just builds on that. And Peter is pointing out something that, that Paul points out. Hold your, your finger there in, in 1 Peter and go over to Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. I want to show you something. We're thinking here about how it is that we're living in these strange and troubling times in which we find ourselves living in. Peter's teaching us as he speaks to the, the folks many centuries ago, uh, people classified as aliens and strangers. You wonder whether you identify with people who are aliens and strangers. Well, Paul tells us in Philippians 3.20 that all of us uh, do. He says, look, uh, for our citizenship, there in verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also (coughs) eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, reminding us as followers of Jesus Christ that this world is not our home. That's what this... The Bible is trying to convince us of that, that, that we have been granted when we repent and trust Christ, citizenship in, in heaven. Uh, we look forward with eager expectation to that. And, 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 and Peter is reminding these folks of that, the, the use of those two words, alien and stranger, not just have they been removed from their physical home and, and required to move to another area uh, for the purposes of Rome, but Peter says, even more than that, this entire world is not your home. Your home is the one that's been granted to you in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> He's reminding them, them of that. Knowing the characteristics of alien and strangers is going to help us to, to, to better understand what it is that, that Peter is urging the, the, the folks on to. This is very important because 
Again, this is how we live as followers of Jesus Christ, isn't it? Well, it's at least it's supposed to. That God doesn't mean for us to settle ourselves into this world as if this world is our home. Continually, Scripture is beckoning us to recognize not only our citizenship is in heaven, but, but even more specifically, that God has a plan and a purpose for our lives here in this world, and it's not to see how much of a, a fortune we can amass, how many accolades that we can get from this world, but rather to recognize, in, in, for all intents and purposes, <clears throat> every one of us is a foreign missionary. That we're to be serving God in, in whatever uh, area that He has called us to, whatever context. Let me show you. We strengthen this. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to look at uh, verse 13, just strengthening this point. You're familiar with Hebrews chapter 11, very likely. Uh, it is a chapter that is, is talking about the importance of faith. Uh, verse 6 there it says, And without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God uh, must believe that He is, and He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. That's what Scripture tells us over and over again. Do you want to know how to live a life pleasing to God? Live a life of faith. Trust God in practical ways. And you see uh, that, that the writer of Hebrews is going to, to talk about the lives of, of a num number of, of different folks here. He begins with, with Abel and talks about Enoch and Noah and Abraham and continuing on and then gets down to, to verse 13. Now, all of these names I just mentioned... God is telling us or reminding us these are people that live their lives by faith. Some of them going through great difficulties and, and struggles and, and trials that they went through in their lives. And in verse 13 it says, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance. That is, they just trusted God. They believed what God had to say and they trusted God, welcomed those promises from a distance, knowing that at some point God was going to fulfill those promises. And, and the people lived their, their lives with their eyes fixed on the promises of Christ. That's a word for us. This is how we're to live our lives. And look, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Let me ask you a question here tonight. As you think about your own life, do you consider yourself to be a stranger or an exile? Does, does it feel like you're out of place? I think our natural tendency is to want to fit in, to want to be a part of a group. And, and there's nothing in and of itself that's wrong with that. Uh, but there does come a problem when we begin to do that at the expense of following Jesus Christ. And that's the temptation that this world offers to us. That if we'll just turn away or, or just tone it down with this Jesus talk, that we're going to fit in and be a part of the crowd. And yet, listen to me, God is, is, is beckoning to you through His Word. Don't waste your life. There is so much more that your life could be devoted to than satisfying the desires of the flesh. Satisfying temporary pleasures. That doesn't mean every pleasure is wrong. That's not it at all. But when our lives are consumed with the satisfaction of myself, when I'm living specifically and solely for me, uh, he's encouraging here in this, this Hebrews 11.13 to follow the example of these folks and to trust God and that this should mean something practical day by day in your, your life. We look with expectation to the fulfillment of the promises. Let's look at another example here. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Let me show you something else here that, that, that God's Word teaches us. And how our, our love for, is to be for God and not for this world. 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to begin there in verse 15. And, and John writes this, very, very pointedly, I might add, as you look at this, this verse, 1 John 2.15, he says, Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. That's pretty plain, isn't it? Makes a lot of sense. Easy to understand. He goes on there, but he says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now that's an important statement. We're, we're trying to get our understanding from God's perspective, not from what comes to us naturally. And God tells us that if the love of the world is in us, 
then the love of the Father is absent from us. That we should be seeking God, seeking His kingdom, seeking His righteousness. He goes on, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but from the world. By the way, those three things that John just talked about here, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, come naturally to us. Fallen individuals born into this world, they're going to come naturally. But we already know how to do that. We won't even need to think about it. It will just come naturally to us. Uh, But John reminds us here in verse 17 in thinking about this. Don't live your life trying to satisfy temporary pleasures. Don't waste your life just trying to please yourself. Why? Look at verse 17. The world is passing away. This is temporary. This is, this is like a, a, a vapor or a mist that's in the wind. This world is passing away and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Again, God is, 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 is crying out to us embrace the fact that this world is not your home and and follow Christ. Seek Him first in His kingdom and and, and His righteousness as aliens and strangers. Do you identify that way? This is how Scripture identifies us. So what does He tell us as aliens and strangers? He says there, notice, to abstain from fleshly lusts. Now, although that word lust is often associated with intense sexual desire it's not the only way that it's used very important that we understand this turn with me uh first thessalonians chapter 4 first thessalonians chapter 4 thinking about this idea of lusts <clears throat> we are certainly familiar with it in the context of of sexual lust this this passage right here in first thessalonians chapter 4 makes it very plain to us uh, what god says about uh, sexual immorality uh, and, and, and chasing after those sexual lusts that are inappropriate. He says here, beginning in, in verse 1, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Finally, brethren, we request and exhort. Again, very intense language that Paul uses here. We exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us instruction how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk. He's telling them, you're, you're living like this. Keep going. All right? and, and he says that you excel still more. Keep growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. For this is the will of God for your sanctification. Now this is important, what he's about to say. it, But I want you to take notice of the fact that number one, this is the will of God. And number two, The purpose of it is for your sanctification, that you may grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says that you abstain from sexual immorality. That you abstain, that you don't do this. Again, recognizing that there is a natural inclination, as we've already seen with the the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life. We have a natural inclination toward things that are contrary to what God has to say. But, but Paul is, is, is admonishing us here to abstain from sexual immorality. He says in verse 4, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not, look at verse 5, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that no man transgress or defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger in all things. Don't think, he says here, don't think that it doesn't matter. It does matter. The Lord is the avenger. If you think that, that this doesn't make any difference, you'll, you'll find out certainly that, that it does. He says, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives His Holy Spirit to you. God's telling us that that when people reject what God has to say, whether it be related to sexual morality and purity or any other matter that we might think of, 
that it's not man who's being rejected, but it's God. It's the very Word of God that's being rejected. And Paul is saying, please don't do this. Please don't give in to this. Understand that God has a plan and a purpose in this world, that God is holy and God is righteous. And you must not reject Him. Follow Him. Listen to what God says. Trust God. This is about having faith in God. That's what it comes down to in very practical ways. These ideas that we can, we can say we have faith in God and yet live in any way that we want to are wholly inconsistent with what Scripture teaches us. We are to follow God. To trust God. To do what God has called us to and commanded us to. That's what, that's what we're to do. <clears throat> now, continuing on, we're thinking about this idea that, that Peter talks about in, in, in verse 11 abstaining from fleshly lusts. And clearly, that resonates with us. We're familiar with with what the Bible teaches about sexual immorality. But it's important for us to know that when we're thinking about this idea of lust, we're not just talking about sexual immorality. There's more that goes along. I want you to understand this. So Galatians chapter 5, I'm going to give you you a a couple of examples here. Galatians chapter 5. Beginning in verse 17. Galatians 5, beginning in verse 17. Very powerful statement that that Paul makes here. He says in verse 17, For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. So we recognize already that there's, there's a war of sorts that's going on. Peter uses that language. Paul does as well. There's a war of sorts that's going on here. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh Uh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please so we're to live our lives differently that's essentially what what paul's saying there okay now verse 18 but if you are led by the spirit you are not under the law so if you're walking with christ you're not under the law by grace you have been saved that you're not living your life thinking that you've got to check off some boxes on a checklist to make sure that you're okay with God. But walking by the Spirit, your heart has been transformed. You're a new person in Jesus Christ. And because of that, you're going to live differently. So if you're led by the Spirit. However, if you're not, notice what he says here in verse 19. Now the deeds of the flesh, that is the person who's not walking by the Spirit, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, and sensuality. Now all three of those words in the Greek give the idea, again, reiterating the the, the idea of sexual immorality. The Bible talks about it frequently. You say, why why is that? Well, because we struggle with that so much. All the more in the culture that we're living in today. People think that they can turn away from what God says. Well, they do so to their own detriment as the Word of God very clearly says. Um, So those three words right there, but that's not it. Now look what he says here. Verse 20. We're going to dig into this idea of of abstaining from the lust of the flesh. What is that lust of the flesh? He says, idolatry, uh, sorcery. That Greek word there is pharmakeia. Uh, 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 You hear probably the the first part of that, pharma, like pharmacy. It's the idea of using uh, drugs or mind-altering substances uh, to engage in, in religious activity there. So idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, dispute, dissension, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Paul is saying, I'm not giving you an exhaustive list. This isn't everything. I'm giving you an illustrative list. I'm helping you to, to understand things like these. Now listen to what he says. Now look. Before we get into this, you you really need to make a decision here. Are you going to believe what the inspired and inerrant Word of God says or not? I mean, that's what it comes down to. Because it says what it says. He says right there, um, of uh, which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things, now look, will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's not something that someone made up. That's not something that that a pastor put in there. That's, That's God's Word. He says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. People who practice these sorts of things. And you say, 
okay, well, why is this? What's going on here? Well, we're talking about uh, this idea of lust. All right? let, me, let me expand on that before I deal more specifically with that question. This idea of lust. What do we mean by that? Lust is satisfying desires regardless of the cost. Lust is not just about sexual immorality. It's satisfying desires regardless of, of the cost. Essentially, when we think about the biblical definition or explanation of lust, it would be along the same lines as the teaching that we give in our addiction ministry. Talking about, the, it's, it's really the very same idea here. It is that, that something, anything, whatever it is, something has become the most important thing, the thing for which I'm willing to sacrifice everything else. When you're thinking about this idea of lust, it's a strong desire for something that you're willing to sacrifice anything else. The mouse wanted uh, the, the, the glue trap because it smelled good. And it was willing to step on there. Now I know he's not reasoning all that out in his mind, but follow the illustration. All right? He's willing to step on there because that becomes the most important thing. Now he's trapped. He's trapped in, in the thing that he desired. And it's going to cost him something. It's going to cost him his leg or his life. Um, in the, the illustration, it cost him his leg. So the idea here when you're thinking about lust is, is someone wanting something more than they, they, they want anything else. They're, they're willing to sacrifice everything else. That's really at the heart of that word that, that Paul uses there at the beginning of verse 20 in Galatians 5, that word idolatry. If you ever read through your Old Testament and you see all of these references in the Old Testament to idolatry, people read that and oftentimes some will skip over it and they say, well, there's no sense in this. We don't struggle with idolatry. We imagine in our minds that idolatry is bowing down to a golden statue. That's not idolatry. That's a fruit of idolatry. But idolatry is taking something, anything, and making it the most important thing. The purpose, when you think about in the Old Testament, people bowing down to statues, the purpose was not bowing down to a statue in and of itself. That's not what they were trying to accomplish. They believed that that statue, that that false god, was going to give them something. And that by them giving their worship, them devoting themselves to that thing, they would get the thing that they wanted. They had gods for fertility because they wanted children. They had gods that they would worship uh, because they believed that they would provide them with crops or with, with other, other things that they wanted. They looked to these gods thinking that they would provide for them. So they, that is at the heart of idolatry, looking to something that will provide what you want. And, and it becomes so important that you're willing to sacrifice everything else. We're talking here about this idea of lust. It's a desire within me to want something so much that I'm willing to sacrifice everything else. The most dominant issue we deal with in spiritual growth is this issue right here. Uh, is this issue of, of, of lust, of wanting things. And it's not just sexual immorality. Uh, there's all sorts of, of things that we want. We want food. We want uh, to avoid pain. We want um, money. We want power. We want whatever it is. All of these different things we want. And these become the most important thing to us. The thing for which we're willing to sacrifice everything else. For example... You have a, 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 a man and he's, he's wanting money and he's wanting power and he's willing to, uh, to go out and, and to, to, to work his tail off uh, much more than what would be necessary to take care of his family. His purpose is not to take care of his family. His purpose is to get money and power and he's going to do whatever it is. And he's willing, because he wants that so much, he's willing to sacrifice everything else, including his family. He stops spending time with his children and stops spending time with his wife and, and, and the only thing he, he wants to do is make money. He becomes consumed by it. It's a thing for which he's willing to sacrifice everything else. It becomes the most important thing. Listen, lust is a struggle that all of us have. And it's not just sexual immorality. It's anything that becomes the most important thing. If, if, if someone's opinion of you becomes the most important thing, you're willing to do whatever it takes to, 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 to please people, to do what they want you to do. Uh, uh, if, if power, if, if prestige, if education, if 
you can fill in the blank with whatever you want. This is at the heart of, of what we do. <clears throat> this is at the heart of all idolatry. In idolatry, the reason that you see it coming over and over again in the Old Testament is because it's the foundational issue that we struggle with. This is, this is really getting to the core of who we are as, as, as people. And following after these things becomes so natural to us that we don't even need to think about it. It becomes a part of who I am. <clears throat> I'm wanting to satisfy whatever desire this is that, that, that I have. And it becomes the most important thing to me. And it's very clearly seen in addiction. All of us can look at someone who's struggling with drugs or alcohol, with pornography or with gambling, and how these things tend to be so caustic and so destructive. And anybody from the outside looking in can see the damage that, that's being done. And yet, it's not just these things. We all do it over and over and over again when anything becomes the most important thing to us. Our lives become out of control. And, and Paul is telling us here in Galatians, warning us, this isn't what God made you for. The God who created you has so much more for your life than a life devoted to just pleasing your flesh. A life devoted to you living your life on your terms. God's written a knowledge of Himself on our hearts so that we're without excuse. We know that there's a God. Anybody that says that they don't believe God with, with all due respect, I say, I don't believe you. Because God's written a knowledge of Himself on our hearts. We know that there's a God. Someone to whom we are going to answer. And the Bible tells us very clearly that this God is holy and He's perfect. That's the God who we're going to answer to. And He's telling us that we are enslaved. We are entrapped by these lusts, by these desires that we have. Peter wants to strengthen this. Uh, look back there in 1 Peter chapter 11. Look at the, the last statement he says here about those lusts which wage war against the soul. This helps us to understand better uh, uh, and more clearly the nature and the intensity of the struggle that we have in abstaining from these things. Because these, these lusts, they grip our hearts. They blind our minds. They cause us to think that, that, that my life is about how much money I can have or, or how much sex you can have or how much power you can have or whatever it is that, that has gotten hold of you. That's what life becomes all about. And trying to break free from it, it's nothing short of a war, a battle that's being fought. Again, within the addiction ministry, I, I, I think it's such an, an incredible illustration for us to see that. The way people's lives are ruined and the way that oftentimes people try, they recognize the problem and they, they try to give it up, they try to quit. But there's a war that's being waged. John MacArthur in his commentary on this passage of Scripture said, even though regeneration produces a new disposition with holy longings. That's an important statement there. Listen, if you've been saved, you care about what God cares about. If you don't care about the things that God cares about, and he, He's revealed those in His Word, you can be sure that your heart has not been changed. Scripture says that over and over again. He says it creates holy longings. That new life force remains incarcerated. I love this language that he uses. That new life force remains incarcerated within the old, unredeemed human flesh, precipitating an ongoing battle between spirit and flesh. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you know exactly what's being talked about here. Turn over with me to Romans chapter 7. It's it's such a familiar idea, uh, this recognition that even for the believer, the person who has come to faith in Jesus Christ, we still struggle, don't we? There's this wrestling that's going on because our flesh naturally desires things that are inconsistent with a holy God, with the will of God. In Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse 14, it's a very familiar passage of Scripture. Paul's talking about this wrestling that's taking place. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what 
I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do. Now, why would he like to do it? Because a believer has been changed. I have new desires. I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, <clears throat> confessing that the law is good. That is God's law, what he's, His commandments. So now, verse 17, So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing in, is present in me, that is, I desire to do it. But the doing of good is not. I'm not practicing the thing that, that I know I ought to be doing. Verse 19, For the good I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find in this principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body. That is in my flesh. Now here's that word again. Waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Paul's talking about this wrestling that takes place that Peter's talking about here where he's telling us abstain. He says don't quit. I know that there's a war that's going on. And he's talking there about the intensity. But, but this, is, this doesn't mean that we just give up. Paul's not saying, I want to do these things, I can't stop, so that uh, doesn't make any difference. You see, he's continuing on uh, engaging in this, this war, this, this wrestling against the flesh because the desire to follow God. We think about that, how we're to respond to this, and what Peter's telling us back here in 1 Peter, that, that we are to engage. He says, I urge you as strangers and aliens to abstain uh, from the fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. He's using very aggressive language there, very forceful language in telling us how we're supposed to respond to these things. War isn't about diplomacy. It's not about words. It's about force. And Paul's picturing that. And Peter is picturing that in both of these passages of Scripture and how we're supposed to respond. Listen, this is not negotiable. And I understand in the culture that we're living in, increasingly people are uncomfortable with just teaching what God's Word has to say. But we're not doing anybody any favors when we act like God has not spoken on a particular topic. He has. And it's not because He's mean and hateful and He wants to keep people from, from having a wonderful life. That is a plan and purpose for your life. It involves holiness and righteousness and being forgiven and welcomed into the kingdom of God. And so he cries out to us, abstain from those, those fleshly lusts that are warring against your, your soul. He continues on there in, in, in verse 12. And, and, and to punctuate this, if it's not enough, the holiness and righteous commands of God which, which we should obey. He continues on and, and he, he wants us to think about this from another perspective. Verse 12, he says, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander, slander you as an evildoer. The idea here is that, 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 that people are noticing Christians are not going along with what everybody else is doing. And they're mocking and they're ridiculing them for not going along with the culture. And Peter says, don't quit. Because in the very thing that they're slandering you as evildoers, look, they may, because of your good deeds, because you don't quit, you keep following Jesus Christ, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, they see you doing them, you're conspicuously living your life as a Christian, they may glorify God in the day of visitation. In the second coming of Jesus Christ, when, when the great judgment comes, Peter's saying you're living your life as a living testimony in this world to this lost and dying world. And I understand everything inside of you makes you want to go along with the desire, the lust that you have. Peter says resist it. 
Because your life is being used by God, not only to glorify God, that's plenty enough, but it's also being used by God as a witness to other people. That Christ has changed us, that He's transformed us. And it doesn't mean that we're perfect, but we're to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what He calls us to. Now let me give you four practical things here we're thinking about how do we overcome lust. First off, I want you to remember that the source of the lust is coming from the heart. It's coming from the heart. It's the reason that the writer of Proverbs 4.23, watch over your heart with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life. Why do I do what I do? Because I do what I want to do. That's why. And to, to, to change, I must participate with God to transform who I am. And as my heart changes, my behavior changes. I say that every week in the addiction ministry. It's a reminder. I would contend that every Christian ought to be saying something along those lines. That's how we tr- we're transformed. Overcoming lust requires that, that I remember and recognize that the source of lust is coming from my heart. And for, for my lustful desires to stop, my heart has got to change. And so number one, here's what I need to do. Repent of my sin. 1 John 1, nine tells us if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Any sin that you're involved with, the, the way that you respond to God is not to make excuses, not to pretend like it's not a sin. It's to go to God and tell on yourself to Him. Confess it. He already knows, but He's telling you in, in faith to go to Him and to trust Him. Confess your sin to Him. Number two is to resist the urge. Resist the urge. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, beginning in, in verse 3, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. We're talking about how do we fight this war. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So I'm resisting the lust. I'm resisting these, these desires that are seeking to over, overtake me. That's what Paul says as well in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24. Put off the old self, being renewed in the spirit of the mind, and putting off the, on the new self. So we repent of sin, we resist the urge, we renew the mind. That my thinking comes in line with the Word of God. This is why over and over again, I'll say it as long as the Lord keeps me here, the importance of Christians just engaged in their faith, reading the Bible, being with other Christians, listening to God's Word being taught, uh, studying God's Word, listening to, to godly music, watching godly television programs, things that are influencing us, being in godly relationships where we're encouraging one another on to good works and godliness, and we're fighting those lustful desires with the truth of of, of God's Word. If it's a sexual immorality, uh, the psalmist tells us in Psalm 1611, for example, in your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. God has so much more for us than anything that this world could offer to us. And that we, our mind would be re- renewed with the truth of God's Word. So repent of sin, resist the urge, renew your mind, and then, number four, repeat. Keep walking in the Spirit. Don't quit. Don't give up. And recognize that as you walk in the Spirit, that in and of itself, your relationship with, the, with God, with the Holy Spirit, is going to transform your desires. It's why, again, Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not. Now that word in Greek, never, you could translate that. You will never carry out the desires of the flesh. So if you're carrying out the desires of the flesh, what's it telling you? You're not walking by the Spirit. This is what God calls us to do. To walk by the Spirit. That's how you do it. That the Lord Jesus Christ is going to strengthen and empower you to live your life as a committed follower of Jesus Christ for His glory and for a testimony to this world. So, I'll leave you with this. Will you restrain your desires so that you can glorify God and be a testimony to other people? Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, I thank You for the truth of Your Word. And Lord, You know that it is much easier for us to read and study Your Word than it is for us to live it out. I pray, God, that as we wage this war, that we would love You and trust You enough to be willing to just follow You
to seek after you and your kingdom and your righteousness. And as we encounter these, this, this war that's waged within our own bodies, this war with the lust of the flesh, Father, that, that we would choose by faith to follow you, to trust in you, to recognize that our lives are not about uh, simply how much pleasure we can, we can enjoy or how much we can uh, uh, earn money or, or gain power or whatever it is that's most important to us. But God, that, that there's so much more in this world. And it's about loving you. And it's about loving one another. And it's about helping other people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, may that be our testimony. May you be glorified in it. In Christ's name, amen. I trust that the teaching of God's Word was a ministry to you today. Uh, again, I want to invite you to come out to our services at 645 on Wednesday evenings and on Sunday morning for our worship at 1030. In addition to that, we have a variety of opportunities and activities throughout the week to minister to both children and adults. You can find out more information on our website. God bless. I hope you have a great day.